you know, Ross, I really appreciate you uh, uh, rejoining the podcast after our first failed attempt. We had an amazing conversation and uh, uh, I uh, unfortunately forgot to record <laughs> the session, but we are yeah. all set today. We are recording and uh, I'm super thrilled to, to really talk just because uh, we didn't really know each other too much. Um, but after a couple of quick conversations, realized that, you know, we have a lot in common and uh, uh, just really have enjoyed our conversation so far. So thank you so much for taking time and uh, doing this again. You're welcome. Happy. And so, you know, we met through kind of, uh, of a friend of a friend who of a friend who, you know, I had gotten introduced to and in, in that you had known. And so it's really nice to kind of talk to, you know, individuals. And I know one of the big reasons that I wanted to have you on is just because, you know, you do a lot for other people. And so I really wanted to, to kind of talk about that because I really love uh, when people know what they want for themselves and kind of go after and do this thing, but then also have, you know, others in mind. And so uh, I remember it from our first conversation, you were saying that that was just something that was really kind of instilled as a, as a kid, right? Just helping others, serving others, you know, just uh, being kind of a, a good human, right? Like, and so, and so how did that all kind of come about? You said, I think that you're, you know, your parents were just really, you know, great role models as far as that's concerned. I couldn't be more fortunate. Um, I was raised in a household where my parents ran the first community residence program in the state of Massachusetts, one of the first, um, when the state deinstitutionalized. And so our family uh, were caretakers for about nine um, you know, pretty significantly handicapped women. And they lived in the house we lived in. We were their caretakers. And so I was, I learned, saw, did, and was taught support, helping others, compassion, um, and, and giving back. And my, my parents uh, talk about all those things still today. I'm fortunate to have both of them still in my life. And they talk about those kinds of things still today. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, passion for helping others and making a difference that hasn't gone away. Um, they're in their seventies and they, we still talk about those things. We still talk about and tell stories about some of the people we took care of. So I knew at a pretty young age, I was fortunate to know that I, I was going to do something with helping people. I just didn't know how I was going to apply it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then ended up applying it to, you know, people development training and, and helping individuals, whether we're working with professionals or high school students, uh, helping individuals understand themselves better, become better versions of themselves, and then find and go live a life with purpose and fulfillment and happiness. And that I love it. my true passion, Scott. Yeah. And it's, and it's pretty rare, right? Like to be able to do, you know, it's hard to kind of, I guess, grasp, right. To be able to do things that, you know, you want to do that give you fulfillment and joy, but that also help other people. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like, you know, I get paid for this, right. Like, you know, right. Because it's, it, there's, I don't know, there's really such a great feeling, regardless of what you do for work and the line of work that you do, there's, there's just such an amazing um, uh, reward that you get when you're helping people, right? And you hear it all the time that that can't help, you know, that have no way of helping you back or that don't even know that you're helping them or just, or even if they do know that you're helping them, you know, there is this, this just wanting to help without receiving anything in return, I, I guess is really what I'm trying to say. And, and that level of, of giving is, is amazing because you get so much in return too. Yeah, I am lucky to be living what I've heard a number of people say and two people in particular that are close to me in my life. I remember them saying this to me vividly um, one of my mentors, his name is Paul Brown, 
Um, he, he talks about this often. And my father-in-law and one of his best friends, when you match your vocation with your advocation, you know, what you do for work with what you really enjoy in life and something that's important to you, you don't work a day in your life. Mm. I am very fortunate that I get to wake up in the morning and absolutely love what I do and who I do it with. I yeah. Love- yeah. And it's, uh, you know, in, and there's nothing like, you know, building a team and then, you know, helping other, um, you know, professionals. And I know that you do a lot of work, right. With, uh, with professionals and, and, and just helping, helping teams get to a better place, right? Like sometimes we get stuck in this, you know, wanting to move forward, but just only looking at things the way that we typically look at them. Or even if we try to look at for different perspectives, sometimes it's, you know, it's really hard to get that without sometimes this, this outside individual just kind of coming in and and just challenging things a little bit. And so how do you, how do you kind of go about and really just, you know, make those relationships and be able to, you know, I, I guess, you know, help individuals, help companies, you know, just get to a better place. Yeah. Well, so I, I don't think and certainly for me, if you're a coach of any kind, whether you're a mother or father and you're coaching your kids sports, you're leading a team, you're coaching a sport, um, there's probably nothing more rewarding and fulfilling and nothing that gets me more high than seeing work you do and effort you put into, whether it's an entire culture, a team, or an individual you're working with or coaching, nothing more high than seeing um, them be- become fulfilled, mm-hmm. or improve, become happier. Um, that, that for me is very rewarding in order to do that. The way I like to think of it is for the people in, on my team, for the people in my life, I want them to know that I am their biggest fan and their toughest critic at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I live both of those. And I'm confident my team would tell you that I cheer them on. I encourage them. I support them, but I'm also tough as heck on them. So I build relationships and that's probably one of one of the things I enjoy doing the most is building relationships with people and meeting new people. Mm -hmm. I figure, or I believe that if you want to listen to me, um, you're going to do it more. And in order for you to want to listen to me, um, I do think you need to like me at the same time. You need to trust and respect that I'm going to tell you what you might not want to hear. Yeah. And I, you know, do you want to be liked or do you want to be respected? Both. Both. Why, why do they have to be mutually exclusive? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Give me both. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's no reason that, um, uh, that you can't enjoy who I am as an individual and also respect you know, the work that we're going to do or the work that I'm going to get out of you or just, you know, and, and a lot of times people are going to be resistant, right? Because it gets uncomfortable, right? Like all of this work starts to dig deep into things that people sometimes just really don't want to talk about or really don't want to admit or don't want to, you know, and, and all of that energy only comes from, I don't really want to share this, or I really don't want to admit this to myself or, you know, but but, you know, you get to a point, right, where you start loving the process and, you know, the goal is great, but the process of getting there is enlightening. And, uh, and that's the fun part about all of it. You know, we, we like to say, and I've said more times than I can count, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. Because when you're uncomfortable, you're learning and you're growing, you're outside your comfort zone. It's hard because... I mean, brain science, neuroscience, research alone shows you that it takes about 30 days to try something or practice something so consistently where that new neural pathway starts to form, but Mm -hmm. the 90 day mark, it hasn't stuck. So if you think about that, you have to do something 
for that long, that consistently for change to really set mm -hmm. it. So I'm having conversations with clients and people today and they're, you know, I, I, I was having a couple of conversations in the last couple of weeks with some people that are frustrated because, you know, their people are struggling to reacclimate to the workplace and come back in the office. And I said, well, let's talk about habit forming for a minute. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this for nearly a, well, we did it for a year and three months. Yeah. March to the following June. Mm -hmm. When you do something so consistently, basically every day of your life, which is work remote, from March to the following June, it is so ingrained in your habits now, it's the norm for you, that getting people to reacclimate to what the old yeah. norm was. Nobody wants to do it. It's going to be hard and it's going to be uncomfortable. You can't rush that and you can't get impatient or frustrated with it. No. You can want to get back to some form of the old way where teams are working together in the same room with each other because mm -hmm. I think still think you can't. You, you can't replace that value of getting a group of people in the same room. Oh, without a doubt. And then you're going to find some people who are, you know, anxious to move, yes. but you know, just like in anything else, you've got early adopters, you've got, yep. you know, the, yep. the, the majority of, of people. And then you've got the late stragglers who, you know, don't ever want to make that change. And that's just the natural part of, of all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I like what you said before, because, you know, I really believe, and, and this wasn't something that I believed in myself before I started kind of like my whole journey, but I really truly believe, right, like that everyone has a shining star with inside of them. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has value. And it shouldn't all be the same. Instead of focusing on all of the negative things, like focus on what you're good at, what you enjoy, what brings you um, you know, excitement, enjoyment, and, and, and passion into your life and, and follow those things. And, and, and you get to realize, you know, all of the great things that you have inside and that you can then develop and, you know, give those, give that back to the world. Right. Look, some people, I, I, I absolutely believe that some people are just lost. They've, they've been um, discouraged They've worked for the wrong kind of person, the wrong kind of culture. Yeah. They've just lost their way. Um, or maybe they're, maybe they don't have clarity on what their purpose or gifts really are or could be. And when, when you can help somebody find that mm. you watch their enjoyment and their excitement and their happiness uh, increase, that is incredibly fulfilling. Yeah. And, and I'm, awesome watch. and I'm sure you, you work with a lot of people, you know, kind of just like I do where, you know, it's amazing how people just don't understand the words that they say or the words that other people say, you know, the effect that it has on individuals, because I start talking to people and, you know, it's amazing how information that people are giving you can truly determine and, 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 and maybe stop things that you want to do for yourself because you're thinking about if somebody's thinking that, then everyone's thinking that, and maybe I shouldn't, am I, am I wasting my time? Am I not doing this? And, and instead of listening to the people who just want to support the fact that this is something that you enjoy and that gives you something, then follow that and do that regardless, right? Like that's not wrong. Um, but there's not a lot of people giving that type of support. And I think that we all need that support, right? Like, because you're not wrong. If it gives you enjoyment and it gives you passion for whatever reason, follow it, do something with it. It doesn't have to be your, your life goal, but maybe you volunteer with something. Maybe you just spend some of your time doing something that, you know, and again, it just, it gives you, but it's amazing how, sometimes our own self-talk and the way that other people, um, their opinions, their bias uh, of something kind of really affect other people. I think there's plenty of people that have faulty beliefs based on all kinds of reasons why and experiences, their upbringing, their family, a, a really bad manager, a uh, bad boss. And so people put things in their head that, that aren't true. 
I think a lot of people do that. We put stories, we make up narratives in our head that aren't true. And then we feed those narratives looking for reasons why we're right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the value of having people around you and in your life that can be objective, who can be supportive and encouraging, but also tough on you. Yeah. I think those are incredibly valuable people to have in your life. And I'm fortunate to have had a number of those in my life. And I hope that I am one of those people for the individuals in my life that I meet um, that, you know, that I'm supportive, that I'm encouraging, that they have fun working with us and, and, you know, having a conversation with me that, um, you know, that I'm going to support what they want to do, but also be tough on them and honest and real with them mm-hmm. at the time. You know, I, I, I appreciate that I have friends and clients in my life that will call me for advice. And one of the reasons why they will call me, I think they would tell you, is because I'm going to tell them what they really need to hear. I'm going to give <clears throat> real answer. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to validate their opinion. Um, I'm going to be honest with them and objective. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't take that lightly. And it, and it takes a lot to get comfortable with yourself to then be able to do that, right? Like if you're not comfortable with who you are and, you know, all of that, then you know, then it's hard to give that information. But when you're comfortable with with who you are and the things that you've done, um, regardless of what people say, right? Like you get you get comfortable delivering that information. And um, yeah, and it takes a lot for people to get comfortable in their own skin and and comfortable with their own thoughts. And, and conflicts hard, conflicts uncomfortable. It takes a lot of courage to tell someone what you're really thinking or what they need to hear. No question. Yeah. The way I look at it and have always looked at it is, if I am a partner in your development or I'm a friend in your life, it's my responsibility. Because what's the right thing to do as a partner or a friend? my responsibility to, to, to deliver bad news and trust. Um, most people, I think, think of trust related to integrity, morals, ethics, and all those things that typically go with it. Um, I measure trust certainly those ways, but another huge component of trust for me is I want to be able to trust what you're telling me and that you're telling me what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. You're capable and willing to deliver bad news. You could be the greatest person on the planet, but if you're not telling me what you're really thinking, it's going to be hard for me to trust you. And I want people in my life to know that I'm always willing to tell you what I'm really thinking and what you might really need to hear in a supportive encouraging knowing that it's coming from a place of love like i'm not yes. saying something because i'm trying to hurt you and it's amazing because you can certainly understand the difference when you're delivering news in a hateful manner regardless of what it is it's not going it's always going to come across that way but if i deliver bad news in a loving manner it's just it's it's news. I'm sorry that I have to deliver this or say something that I, you know, I respect your opinion, but I feel that, you know, that this is a better route or that you're going down a wrong path or, you know, that it could be destructive or whatever the news is. It's just that, Hey, listen, I, you know, I only want the best for you. And, and so this is coming out of love. I, I, my father used to say all the time, you can cash that check at any bank in America, Mm -hmm. meaning trust. If you have that reputation, if you have that relationship with the people in your life, you can cash that bank at any, or cash that check at any bank in America. And I think that's true. Um, And I don't, I don't take that lightly, but it's, it's, it's all in the, how you deliver it. You know, I, I'm, confident that the people, whether it's clients and and organizations we support or the people in my life personally, I'm confident they will tell you that I'm very direct and honest with them, but they know I care about them and love them. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 not a word that is uncomfortable for me to talk about or share love Mm -hmm. in business. 
a lot of people don't want to talk about love. They think it's fluffy. They think it's, uh, they, they don't, I'm not sure there's, you know, how many people really think that, you know, love has a place in business. I absolutely think it has a place in business and love is something that is incredibly important to me. And I'm confident that the people in my life know that I really care about them and love them. Yeah. 100%. Love is a powerful word. It's a powerful motivator, right? Like there's a whole lot of things that just come with just being genuine and loving. And, you know, again, even in a work setting, you know, if I'm coming with things from love, it's just, uh, again, I only want the best. I only want the best for you. I only want the best for your family. I only want the best for the people that you do things with. And so the only way that I can do that is to help you be that best person and however that comes across, but yeah, no. And that's a, uh, it's an amazing quality to have. And one of the things that, you know, we had an amazing conversation because I think that we're very, very similar. You learned it a very about yourself, you know, kind of early on where it took me a long time to kind of understand this about myself, but just being sensitive, right. And, and then having some of those, peaks and valleys that come with being highly empathetic um, that for me, I didn't truly see that until I, until I started to kind of understand how to level myself out, how to take away some of those highs and some of those lows and just get into a, you know, kind of a, a better mindset about all of that, or just being able to, to kind of handle I guess the highs and the lows and how to get out of the lows for myself and what to do for myself so that I don't stay in that place. Uh, when you, when you're a, a empathetic, emotional, sensitive feeler, you're going to have highs and lows. Mm -hmm. You're going to have ups and downs and there's no question I and probably everybody listening to this or watching this have had plenty of those ups and downs. Mm -hmm. The key is to not get stuck there. Yes. Um, I used to get stuck there. Yeah. I, same. Like, especially in the lows, like I used to really get yes. stuck in the lows, not so much the highs, yeah. Yeah. Um, but really like just feeling bad about myself for various reasons, whether, you know, it was a situation or just uncomfortable with myself. And quite frankly, as a kid, I didn't know how to deal with my sensitivity because all of my other friends, you know, weren't like me. And, you know, they didn't, they didn't handle situations the way that I did. And, and, you know, and, even to this day, my wife will tell you, like, we're watching a, uh, you know, a movie and there's an emotional scene that comes on and it gets me every time. Like it just, a, you know, it, it can't not get me. You even have a Rudy picture in your back when we were doing that. And I'm like, I can't watch that movie and not cry at the end. It's just, it's a, but you know, that just comes with all of that, but I didn't understand it, you know, earlier on. I think when you're younger and you're a kid, you don't understand it because you think it, you're, you might even get picked on or your, your tougher friends, your, uh, your more confident, you know, driven friends around you when you're a kid, when you're an adolescent, you know, they, they, they look at that or they make fun of that. They pick on you for it. But I, yeah. um, I would much rather be that kind of adult who has that. Than, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, it just goes with the turf. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, for me, it's probably also part of coming from a big Italian family. Um, I have tons of uncles and aunts and cousins and, you know, my, my parents and all growing up coaching me, my dad, my dad's a hugger. He's not afraid to tell you how he feels. They, yeah. they don't hold back on that. And, you know, my kids know this. I mean, heck when the movie wonder came out, Scott, yeah. <laughs> story about Augie Pullman. Um, my wife took the kids to the movies to go see it with a bunch of their friends. And my kids didn't want me to go deliberately <laughs> going because they didn't want their friends to see me. Cry. Is dad coming? Oh no. He's, I don't want him to cry in yeah, front of my dad, friends. Mom, mom, we can't have dad. I, <laughs> dad's good. Dad's going to cry the entire movie. I don't want my friends seeing my dad cry constantly. 
<laughs> it's so funny. Every even every like the animated Disney movies, like, and there's some amazing messages. And I love, you know, there's some really amazing messages in some of these, uh, you know, Disney and animated movies that are I, I think are great for kids to to watch and listen and things like that. But um, but even those, you know, at the end when you know, when it's triumphant and you get all the feels, like I feel it and I, I, I can't not feel it. And uh, it's wild because my wife always looks over and she's like, yep, I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's about being, I think it's important to be in touch with your emotions. Yeah, no, I, and, and now know, I, we have a, a wide range of them, right? Emotions, excitement, happiness, joy, frustration, anger. We have a wide range of emotions I think it's good to be in touch with those emotions and to be able to express them in a healthy, productive way. I I, yeah. And now that I, now that I, I, I understand that and I, I like, I accept that about myself and I realize that it's just what makes me, me, and I'm happy about that. And I, and I like that I can connect with people that way and, 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 and feel something. It also allows me to know that, you know, part of the reason why I can connect with so many various people is because they sense that, you know, right away, um, you know, and they get that back, right. I'm saying just for you is that, that, that level also translates back when, you know, you're kind of connecting with people. Well, you know, in, in our work and for me personally, we work people through an exercise quite often and I'm clear about what mine are on helping an individual or a team create a set of non-negotiables, personal core values. Yeah. I have a set, my team, friends, they would all tell you, they know exactly what mine are. They know what my non-negotiables are. They know what I stand for. They know what I'm about. And for me, um, you know, compassion and sensitivity, that, that's all a big part of who I am. Mm-hmm. Caring about people is non-negotiable for me. Yeah. So the way I look at it, Scott, and the way I'd encourage others to think about it, is if there's something that's so fundamental to who you are and what you believe in, and somebody doesn't like you because of it, or doesn't want to work with you because of it, why would you want to work with them? Yeah. Stop chasing something that you don't really even probably want to catch. I, I, no, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I, I will walk away. I'm willing to, you should be willing to walk away from a relationship that asks you to jeopardize or sacrifice something that is so fundamental to who you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I encourage people to be really clear yeah, and, and fanatical about standing for what they believe in. And I think that people just need to spend a little bit more time developing that right like thinking about that thinking about who they want to be exactly you know having these pictures so you can begin that process and you can understand when you're you know is this situation drifting in any sort of way that allows me to to kind of you know maybe put myself in a vulnerable situation to maybe not make the best decision these are the things that you know allow you to kind of stand true to to who you are but it's self-discovery and again it's you know, it's hard. It's uh, self-discovery is not an easy thing to do, but it's a wonderful process that we all should take. Regardless of when you get there, it's incredibly rewarding. Whether you get there at 20, 40, 60, or 80. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredibly rewarding when you get there, regardless. Yeah. Yeah. And now you and your wife do a lot of uh, volunteer work and I wanted to kind of talk about that as well. So, so what is, what is that work that you guys do? There's a number of things that we're yeah. passionate about and involved in, um, you know, whether it's supporting local charities and organizations that have either a purpose or a mission that's close to Liz and I, that is meaningful to Liz. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the organizations that I continue to support and love supporting and was fortunate enough to be on the board of for a while was Big Brothers Big Sisters mm-hmm. uh, here in Springfield, Mass obviously a great purpose and mission. Yeah. Uh, an organization run by an awesome guy named David Baturn. He's just a quality human being. Um, and I loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we started a, 
um, and we do this pro bono, we started a development program with local students and, and Minichug Regional High School. Started thinking about it 10 years ago, launched it about eight years ago and have since now graduated, I think, uh, three or four groups of students. It's a two-year cohort mm -hmm. to help high school students find purpose. That's amazing. Um, and self-awareness and ultimately help guide them in terms of what they should be thinking about with maybe potential career paths or majors. Um, and, and that was probably, if not the, certainly one of the most rewarding things I've done in my career to this point. Mm -hmm. Um, where especially at that age, right? Like getting somebody starting to think along this way. Like I didn't start this process till I was 40. What would have happened? Where would I be? What could have, you know, if I did this when I was 20, if I started yeah. this kind of thinking yeah. when I was that much earlier, when I was 18, when I was 16, like those are, you know, to start to think that way, even if you don't implement it the same way that you do as an adult to start to understand these things, um, you know, it just leads you on an amazing path. I do a decent amount of that work today with a good friend of mine who's a school psychologist and she and I joined forces to do more of this kind of work. And when you work with a, a, you know, a young adult, a student, and you see um, the growth in them over the period of time you're working with them. You see progress. You see um, them come out of their, you know, their shell and expand and grow. That is one of the coolest damn things you'll experience. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a student we worked with in one of our first groups. Uh, his name was Tim Scully. You know, Tim came to us as a uh, young, very, very polished, very professional, very polite, kind of reserved and nervous uh, young man who didn't have as much uh, confidence. And we saw in him something special. And over the course of two years, Scott, what we saw him grow into and what he is becoming uh, as a young professional and, and adult is uh, incredibly rewarding and and it fills us with pride yeah right like and that's just where i think sometimes people don't understand when when you're doing what you want to and have your goals and your vision in front of you then seeing and having other people you know only brings you ex reach what they want to only brings you enjoyment and excitement versus resentment and anger right like if you if when you people sit back and 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 they look and they're like oh why do they get to, why do they? it's only because they're not really working on things for themselves right like they're feeling stuck or they don't have a path for themselves Yep. And you, you help somebody find, or you, you fill them with confidence. For me, you build someone's confidence Yeah, and it fills them with that inspiration and drive and motivation to go achieve um, and not stop searching until they find what they love and you watch that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I guess that's a great message for people, right? Like if, if you're getting negative information and it's not coming from, you know, a place of somebody just really trying to help you, <clears throat> then it's really not great information that you should be doing anything with, <laughs> regardless of who's delivering the information. If, if it's, you know, if it's not constructive, uh, and it's not, you know, providing an alternative or have you thought about this or be careful about that. And it's just negative, then it's not coming out of any great place. And it shouldn't be information that you're taking in. Um, so one, a, a leader that I've known for the better part of 25 years or so, he put together, his name is Jim, he put together a video recently for uh, a webinar that we've been leading during the pandemic. And it, it, one of the messages in his video for these people to watch is related to 
trust. And sometimes people have a hard time because the, the message they get, you know, we all say we like and want feedback. Mm -hmm. People really do. And so he gives this example. He tells this true story about a time where a colleague of his walked into his office and he was all frustrated and mad and upset. And Jim asked him why he said oh, man, he had just come from their boss's office and gotten some really tough feedback and he was struggling with it. And Jim asked him, is the feedback accurate? Well, yeah. Do you think our boss has any hidden agenda? No. Do you trust our boss? Yeah. Then what's the problem? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we tend to focus on the, unfortunately, the delivery of the message rather than what's behind it. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there accuracy to what I'm hearing? Do I trust the person I'm getting it from? Do I know they care about me? If, if you get some feedback that stings and feedback probably should sting a little bit for it to be effective. Oh yeah. If it, if it doesn't, Scott, I wonder if you're really motivated to change. It's like when somebody says, Hey, I'd really like to see you be a better listener, but it's okay. I know you're a good person and it's coming from a good, a good place. <laughs> and I end it with, but it's okay. That person's not motivated to change. Mm -hmm. The only thing I think we need to ask ourselves is, do I know that person giving me that feedback cares about me? Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. Then you, then we can't get hung up and worry too much about the delivery even because look, people's delivery is going to be, you know, crap. We're, yeah. we're all going to suck at our delivery at different times. Focus on the message. Mm -hmm. If you're getting that kind of feedback from somebody, you know, cares about you. Great. If you can't say that, then you might want to think twice about, being around those kinds of people, if they're, if they're saying it in a hurtful way and it's unproductive and you're not sure you can trust that person or they, that they care about you and love you, that's going to be harder for you. Yeah, no, it really is. And, and, and those words affect some of the things that you potentially do and, 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 and yeah. So no, that's a great perspective too. just, uh, you know, to kind of think about that, as you're kind of basking in whatever you're in to, to, to kind of sit back and, and think about it. But again, it's, you know, it's super hard to do. It's, we have to want to, you know, be able to absorb information and push new boundaries and do new things. And, uh, you know, sometimes people get stuck, but it's a, uh, it's a great place to, it's a great place to get to because uh, so many great things kind of come of it. And, you know, as we start to kind of wrap up, I know we, I know we both have, uh, or, you know, we've got an, um, a little bit of a time constraint, but one of the things that I wanted to ask, you know, you've done some amazing things. Um, you've done some amazing work with, you know, uh, with people, with companies, and then certainly in the volunteering world. Um lots of stuff to be proud of. Um, but when you look back at kind of this picture so far, there's always going to be one or two things that kind of stand out as maybe one of the most things that, you know, you are most proud of, um, you know, aside from family and kids, what would be one of those things that, you know, you're most proud of so far? Um, I would point to a couple examples of things that I'm proud of and, and I take very seriously. The culture and environment that um, we've created and I think largely starts with a leader. So the, the culture that I've deliberately tried to create here in our organization, yep. uh, it's a special feel. It's a, it's a great culture and environment. Um, we laugh a ton, we cry a ton we support and encourage each other and we're tough on each other. And I have been very deliberate about the kind of environment and culture I want to create and, and be a part of mm -hmm. the kinds of individuals I want to work with. Um, that's something that I'm proud of because it pays off in how much you really enjoy your job. Yeah. Uh, so that's one. Ooh, 
I am fortunate, and this comes directly from my parents, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have either an outlook or I don't know if it's a strength or what it is, what you'd call it, but seeing something in other people that other people may not see in them. And Ali, I remember a, a specific example of a story when I was um, earlier in my career and I worked at Mohegan Sun Casino and I was in recruiting um, and a, a woman got passed along to me. Um, I, I got the clear sense that nobody else wanted to interview her or hire her and she got passed along to me and I looked at her application and I was always just, I'm always just honest with people. Um, I want to talk about what's true and real. I, I don't want to hide things mm -hmm. so it can potentially benefit that person I'm sitting in front of. And so I looked at her and I said, look at this application. Tell me why you would want to hire this person. Your job history is not good. Mm. You've had six different jobs in the last nine years. Mm -hmm. That's a risk. Tell me why I should even consider giving you an opportunity. And I just was honest with her. And she went through telling me about some things in her life uh, that she wasn't proud of. She went through telling me about some things that uh, mistakes she's made that she took full ownership of. And for me, Scott, I'm always going to give somebody another chance or an opportunity when they take ownership of the mistakes they've made. Yeah, she exactly. Me great vulnerability and ownership. And she looked at me and said, give me a chance and I won't let you down. And I believed her. I believed her. I saw something there. Maybe that nobody else or not a lot of other people saw. And so I hired her. And about two years, two and a half years later, as I'm leaving, it's on my last day. Um, my, my departure um, was announced to the organization. I was coming to this business. And uh, who shows up? and walks up behind me, I don't even know she's there, taps me on the shoulder, and this is being a sensitive emotional person, I'm gonna get emotional thinking about this, Scott. Yeah. Taps me on the shoulder, I turn around and it's her. Mm. And she said, I just wanted to wish you best of luck mm. to leave here and let you know that I'm still here. I told you I wouldn't let you down and you mean a lot to me because you took a chance on me. You took a risk that probably a lot of other people wouldn't take. Yeah. And that for me, Scott, is a story I will never forget. And that's from, at this point, that's probably going back 17 years, 16, 17 years ago. Yeah, that's crazy. I will never forget that story. Wow. And shit, we got us both cheery. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it you know that again that's a you know that's a great just a great understanding in that you know i love that because uh you know again she was ready to make a change she wanted to make she wanted more and she needed an opportunity and uh, to be able to see that and understand that and then give that is a uh, is uh, is awesome believe in good yeah I believe in good. I want to see the good in people. Yeah. I don't know. I don't ignore the reality. I'm always, I was yeah. with her. Totally. I, I was honest with her, but I always want to see the good and I believe in people. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, and, and it, and it paid off. Have there been plenty of times where it hasn't? Of course. Of course. Will the, will, will, will there be plenty of people you'll take risks on and it may not pan out? Sure. But the one that does makes it feels good. Or five others that don't. Yeah, absolutely. Well, excellent, Ross. I think this is a great place to kind of, uh, you know, uh, wrap this up. But uh, what an amazing conversation as always. Uh, I think we always have a great conversation. Uh, yes, we do. And so I look forward to uh, future ones. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Ditto. Welcome. I appreciate your time. And it's, it's I, like you said, I always enjoy the conversations you and I have because we philosophically align and believe in a lot of the same things. So yeah, thanks to you, Scott. I agree.
All right, my friend. Have an awesome morning. You too.